Good morning. Welcome again. What a wonderful day the Lord has made for us. A day we can rejoice and be glad in Him. And welcome to all the people watching us online. I know a number of people are traveling and they tell me they watch the sermon at some point, sometimes on a Sunday, sometimes during the week. But we've got a big online presence. So thank you for joining us today also then online. A few things. Uh, we are in the middle of our summer program, but we have VBS this week. Vacation Bible School, and I want to thank all the people that worked really hard last week to start to decorate or to decorate the buildings. Do yourself a favor. If you want, after church, walk through the CE building, especially in the multi-purpose room. There's an amazing lot of decoration that they have done in some of the classrooms for the kids that will come this week. Pray for our volunteers. Pray for the children. There will be a, I don't know, how many kids are we going to have? I... 48 kids are going to be here. Thank you, Nicole. So pray for the program and that we can reach into the lives of these children. Um, a new membership class. I started with a new membership class this morning. If you still want to join, you are welcome. Just let us know. The next, cla next class will probably be online. Uh, uh, the second part, but you can be part of the second one and then we can do the first one. So if you still want to join, you are welcome. Just let me know. We've got a guest here this morning. Um, I think we've got other first-time guests also, but Kirby, at the back, uh, Kaloon, he's here from Kufi Christians United for Israel. He's going to do a short My Story uh, at some point during our worship service, and then afterward, we invite you, if you are interested in Israel, interested in what I did a few months ago in Israel, uh, you are welcome. There's a short, a, short a, a small lunch for us in the fellowship hall, and we are going to start with the program as quickly as we can, it'll take an hour or so. But if you want to know anything about Israel and what I did there and what Kufa is doing there, you are welcome to join us after church for this. Even though you didn't sign up, you are welcome. You, there will be food for you. Uh, we'll make sure that there's something for you to eat. If not, we'll give you ice or something. We'll, there'll be something that we can, we can, we can do. Yeah, um, if you see me struggle to lift up my hands when we do the blessing at the end, um, Miguel, I didn't see Miguel, but we had our Faith RDX uh, workout yesterday, and even Hugo couldn't really shake my hands because you can't, he, they really worked us yesterday. So, um, Do we have any first-time guests, uh, except Kirby, um, any first-time guests? If you are here for the first time, please show us your hand. Give him still a loaf of bread if you don't mind, Janet. Uh, Kirby, put up your hand that she knows where you, we know where you are. Just, yeah, please. George, you can do that for us. Kirby, this loaf of bread is a symbol of who we are. We are involved in the lives of people, but it's also a symbol of something else. 
sharing with you not only a loaf of bread, but the gospel, the bread of life. So thank you for being here with us today and that you came all the way from Tallahassee to spend this, day, this time with us. We appreciate this. There's going to be a uh, prayer behind me shortly. I ask that you will silently pray this prayer. Let's ask the Spirit to move in us today. I've got a disclaimer on my sermon today. It's one of those that people do not always like very much. But the scripture reading brought us to this section in the book of Joshua. So it's a harder than an easier sermon. And, and if you have been attending our church for a while, you know I cover the whole spectrum of God's love and grace. And last week I spoke a lot about hope. Not today. So today it's for you and for me, and it's more difficult. So just pray that the Lord today will also use what I need to share with you, that you and I may hear His Word. Let's prepare ourselves to be with God. Please join me in the call to worship as we get there. The heavens are telling the glory of God. All creation speaks volumes of God's handiwork. Each sunrise proclaims God's faithfulness, and the night reveals the Creator's awe. Without a word being spoken, all creation bears witness to the goodness of the Lord. So too may we join in witness with all creation. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be God's signature in the world. Congregation of Jesus Christ and children of God, grace to you and peace. A greeting that does not come from me. A greeting that comes from him who is, who was, and who will come, the God of all ages, our Father. A greeting that comes from the Holy Spirit given to us to guide us, lead us, to help us, to be with us. A greeting that comes from Jesus, the Christ, the firstborn of the dead, that you and I may be reminded that we are created for eternity. The King of all kings, because even though this world seems in so many ways so messed up, God's kingdom will continue its story. Our Lord and our Savior, because He's the only one that can save us. The Lord himself gave us that promise that's on the screen. Whenever people gather in my name, he said, I will be there. And I greeted you just now in his name. We are in the presence of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are not alone, not hanging out here by ourselves. We are with God. So what do we do when we know this? We respond by singing his praises because he's a God that created us to praise him. Singing, how great is our God. When we trust and obey in his word, he can move mountains, he can make walls crumble. So our God is a great God.
very much. That was fantastic. You may be seated. We are just waiting for our little just to get disconnected. <laughs> Call to a new life. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is. And the walls come tumbling down. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. You may talk about your man of Gideon. You may talk about your man of Saul. There's none like good old Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. Up to the walls of Jericho, he marched with the spear in hand. Go blow them ram's horns, Joshua cried, cause the battle is in my hand. Then the lamb ram sheep horns begin to blow, the trumpets begin to sound. Joshua commanded the children to shout, and the walls come tumbling down. Oh, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho. Jericho, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come a-tumbling down. Oh, Joshua, Jericho, Jericho, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down, and the walls come tumbling down, and the walls come Tomlin down, walls come tumbling down. Hey, Sam, thank you. Hey, man, I can now just say amen. We can go home. That was the sermon. Yeah, it's fantastic. He gave away the answer. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. Yeah, no, John, I've heard about your neighbors complaining. That was fantastic. Thank you. And Anna, excellent job. Thanks. Let us, let us pray. 
Oh, children, if there are children, you can leave uh, Courtney's at the back. She will take care of you. Let us pray. We bow low before the God of heaven and earth. We bow low before the one who created all of us. We bow low before you because of your grace, your kindness. We bow low before you because we can experience all these amazing things in our worship service. People with so much gift, skill, that come to serve you as we all came. We bow low before you because you are God and we are not. We bow before you because we know you are not done with this world, our country, and your kingdom's story. I ask, O Lord, that as I need to preach a more difficult sermon today, that you will also help me as I need to proclaim the word of God from the story of Joshua. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. So this pastor decided he wants to see how things are going in his Sunday school. So he popped into one of his Sunday school classes. And it was probably like middle school kids sitting there. And he said, okay, so who knocked down the walls of Jericho? Silence. He said, Billy, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? But he said, pastor, I really do not know, but it wasn't me. <laughs> so the pastor was called out and he had to leave the Sunday school class. And then in that week, he saw one of his elders. He said to his elder, I'm really concerned. The elder said, why? He said, I asked Billy who knocked down the walls of Jericho. And he, his answer was, it wasn't him. And the, and the elder said, Pastor, Billy is a really good kid. You know, and I know his parents, I don't think he would have knocked the walls down, but Pastor, I think we've got money in our buildings and grounds fund that if it's needed, we can fix the, the walls if necessary. Now, this is a stupid story to tell that most people do not know the stories of the Bible. But it works as a joke because everybody knows the story of Jericho and the walls that came down. The world knows the story of Jericho, you know, Google Jericho and walls, and you will see there are bands named after the walls of Jericho and after the story that we find in the Bible. So at last, we are here. I started like two months ago, if not more, preaching from the book of Joshua, and everybody thought, we're going to start with Jericho and the walls, and we are now months in, and we now eventually got to the story today. The book of Joshua and God's will for his people. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have handed Jericho over to you along with its king's soldiers. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. Seventh time when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout! That's exactly what he sang. The Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers that were sent. As for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction, so as not to covet or take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel an object of destruction, bringing trouble upon it. All silver, gold, vessels of bronze, iron, sacred to the Lord, shall go into the treasury of the Lord. It's a bit of a strange story, this. People have tried to disprove the story many times. Uh, when we were in Israel a few months ago, I, we couldn't go to Jericho for a reason. But many years ago, many, many years ago, when Luis and I were there, that was in the BC era, before COVID and cell phones and children and all those things, um, we could get to Jericho. And they are still doing excavation work to see, and they actually found that the walls did fall down on the outside. What a strange story. Why the story in the Bible? It's a story not only for Israel, it's a story for all the people during the time that Israel was on their track and on establishing themselves. But it's also a story for us sitting here in 2020 telling us that God is on His way with His mighty acts with His church through the story of people. In the Old Testament, Israel actually had to represent the people of God so people would know who God is. Now it's the church, our task to do this. And God wants to tell us, guys, I am with you guys. And whatever is needed for me to be able to do my work, I will do. 
I will do miracles. And God has done amazing miracles in the lives of his, life of his church. And I think with some of us in amazing ways. It's a story of human participation because God could have just knocked down Jericho, destroyed all the people, sent in a plague, all died. But God said, no, you are a part of this. You had to walk around this thing and then eventually seven times around the city and then shout and whatever. So they had to do their little part in what, they, what God wanted to give them. When I started this series, I said, God is taking us to His promised places. Not only place, but places. God is taking all of us to His promised places because God wants, us to, wants to bring us to places that are great for us. In your relationship, in your in yourself, in your workspace. All of these promised places that we have that God said, I want to bless you there. God is bringing us there. And sometimes He will do amazing things that we may see and sometimes not. But there's always our part that we need to play, and that's what the story tells me. But it's also then a story of obedience that's asked. Joshua said to the people, leave the stuff that you are going to find in the city alone. It is not for you. Let it go. And there's the story of Rahab, that she and her family actually were spared, because that was the promise that was made to her by the spies, and, and the story continues to say she and her family were spared, because that is who God is. God keeps His promises with all people that are involved in His kingdom work, and if you are true to Him, He will answer His promise. We are done with Jericho. We're done. The walls came down. They took the cities over. But the story is not done. There's a different story that follows the story of Jericho. Israelites broke faith with regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi and Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the Israelites. So, about 3,000 of the people went up there and they fled before the men of Ai. Now, let me just say this. I can't read all of this that's in chapter 7. This is your homework. I just took a few verses. And it's a lot already. Scott said, wow, that's a biblical church with a lot of scripture reading. The men of Ai killed about 36 of them, chasing them from the outside the gate as far as Shebarim, killing them on the slope. The hearts of the people, that's the Israelites, melted. And turned to water, Joshua tore his clothes, fell on the ground before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Ah, oh Lord God, why have you brought this people across the Jordan to all? To hand us over to the Amorites so as to destroy us? Would that have been content to settle beyond Jordan? Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I imposed on them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have acted deceitfully. They have put them among their own belongings. Proceed to sanctify the people. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrows. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. There are devoted things among you, O Israel. You'll be unable to stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things. And Achan answered, Joshua, it is true, I am the one who sinned against the Lord, the God of us all. This is what I did when I saw among the spoil beautiful mantle from Shinar and two shekels of silver, a bar of gold, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. Now they lie hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Go and read the story. Please read the story. Why did you bring this trouble upon us, Joshua asked. The Lord is bringing trouble on you today, and all Israel stoned them and raised over him a great heap, oh, and they burned them with fire, cast stones on them, and raised over them a great, great, great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. The AI disaster. Jericho. So easy. So easy. They shouted, and they got the city. Eight I, eight I, 36 people killed. They had to flee before a small settlement because it was actually not a city or a big town even. It was a small settlement that was sort of in the hill country of Israel. And their hearts turned to water. It melted because they knew they were alone. They knew they were defeated. 
from outside, but also from inside. What was the problem? I can. Or I can. Did you see what it says? Israel have sinned. Israel have devoted things. Israel this, Israel this, and one guy. One guy. One guy, but broke, broke the law. One guy, when he saw everything that was presented to him, decided it was so beautiful, it distracted him, and eventually decided that nobody is seeing what he's doing. He can take it, and he can hide it in his tent because nobody has a clue what he did. That's many times the problem with sin. You think that nobody knows, but God knows. Eventually, destruction and trouble came not only upon him, but on the whole of Israel. What did Joshua do? Joshua did what we normally do. When things start to go wrong, we blame God for it. God, why are you doing this to us? God, look what trouble we are in now because the world is going to see that we can't really defeat the small settlement that you bring us all the way from Egypt to destroy us here. What is your plan with us? And time and time again when I speak to people or I listen to people and things start to go wrong, the first thing they do is they blame God. So why are we in this situation? But they don't ever look at themselves. It's a story of disobedience. So, what does this all say to us sitting in 2020? You know the stories well that I've just referred to now. And what does these stories want to teach me living in America in the year 2020? What it tells me that if I read my Bible, I discover a God that really loves us and cares for us. I discover a God that wants to be involved in our lives because He could have left us alone. I discover a God, and I had a new membership class this morning, and I, 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 I sort of shared it with them also, a God that wants to get us back into the garden. And the garden means to be back in His presence. God wants us to be close to Him that He can take care of us and protect us and provide for us. God's intention with us is not to destroy, not to harm, not to hurt. God is the opposite of what the Bible teaches me. God is a God of love. God is a God that actually loves every single human on this planet. He doesn't care where you are from, how you look, how, what language you speak. God says, you are my creation, therefore I love you. And I care for you. But God is also a God of obedience. You see, that's the problem in this world at this point, is that people want to talk about the love of God. They want to talk about the salvation that we find in Christ Jesus. They want to talk about the grace of God, but they never want to talk about obedience. Maybe I shouldn't go there now, maybe for another day, but our General Assembly is taking place in this, during this week in, in Louisville, Kentucky. The most important meeting for our denomination so I've been following it during the week, and what I've discovered, some, there's a lot of talk about righteousness and about social issues and about a lot of things, but nothing about the kingdom of God, faith and obedience. Nothing. But God has a right to ask us some stuff, isn't it? Because He's God. Why are we the only ones that can ask of Him to serve us, but He's not allowed to ask me to serve Him? So I'm going to tell you a different story, a newer story, a story that may sound familiar because you have heard some of these stories. So this mom and dad had to go away for a week, and they've got two children living at their house, 17 and 18 years old, two boys. And they said, we are leaving. Will you please take care of our house? It's a nice house. It's a great house. Please take care of our house. We'll be gone only for a week. The parents, was, they were just out the door, and these two boys decided to throw a party, and they put it on Facebook. And the Saturday evening or whatever evening, hundreds of kids showed up. And the kids heard in the house how things were being broken and things fell and, and there was drugs and alcohol and all kinds of stuff. Everything went bad with this huge party that these kids were having at this house because these kids, ah, oh, freedom. Eventually the neighbors called the cops and the cops came and it was a disaster. And one of the boys was actually trying to clean up some of the drugs and stuff there. The cops came, him, came in and they arrested him and some others. The parents came back. They visit their son in prison. He said, Mom, Dad, can you please bring me home? That's all I asked for. This is a terrible place. I don't want to be here. Dad, bring me home. And his dad looked at me in the eye and he said, I'm so sorry, this is now your home. Prison. I can't get you out. 
I can't get you out. You are here because of a decision that you have made, and I can't change that decision anymore. I love you dearly. And we will forgive you for your stupidity and what you guys have done, but you will be in prison now. Because that's the consequence of the decision you guys made to throw this party. So what happened in the story? The children live at a house that the parents provided for them, and they say, just hang out with us and be good and great, and you can experience what we have given you. And the children made a decision that actually caused harm not only to them, but to the house, but also to the parents. So now we stand before God, and God says to me, Ferdy, you are my child. I want you to be part of my kingdom. My kingdom is way bigger than your life. Your life is important to me, but my kingdom stretches over time and over this universe. Not only our planet, but the universe. And I would like you to be a part of my journey and my plan, but further I may ask of you to obey me. Because if you do not, you know what's going to happen? Three things. My name will be harmed and hurt. Imagine now Ferdinand is sitting there next to Luis. He messes up this week, as he's done every week. I'm just kidding. My son knows I'm going to do this. But let's say Ferdinand, for some reason, did do something really stupid. How can I, as the dad, hide from that? It will come back to us as a family. To my mother, who's 94, living in South Africa, oh, this is what you said, grandchild did. God says the moment when you step outside of my will, you start to do stupid things. My name is at risk. Because people look at me as God and they say, are you the God we thought you were? Because look at what your kids are doing. The second thing that will happen is my kingdom will be harmed. And that's what the story of Israel tells us in the story of AI. The Lord came and he said to Joshua, hey Joshua, Israel, have sinned. Joshua never at the end said to the Lord, it wasn't us, it was Achan, because he knew there's a responsibility from the family to make sure that the others may, don't mess up. We are co-responsible for each other. The family of God will be harmed if one messes up. That's true of any family. It's true of the church and of the church family. If we, are, if we have someone in a congregation that's trying to, to create division or trying to cause disruption, the whole body will start to suffer. And that's what Paul is saying in Corinthians. He says, if one part of the body starts to struggle or suffer, then the whole body is in pain. And that's what happened here. The Lord said, Israel, you guys have messed up. Because one of, the, of your members did this thing. And the third thing that happens, you yourself, you yourself. And the problem is, and, and, um, and that's what happens when we are disobedient to God, we start to struggle. Do you know what sin is? Sin is trying to tell God, I can do life without Him, without God. Sin is telling God, thank you, but no thank you. I've got it. Sin is saying to God, I think I'm okay, and whatever you say to me, I know the best. You don't need to be involved in my life. And God says, my child, what are you doing to yourself? Because you have no idea. I wrote the manual. I created you. I put you together so I know what will happen if things start to break. You have no idea. Trust me. Trust me. And then we will know. And I'm almost done. That's the problem with sin. We may times think, okay, this is something that Ah, nobody will know. God knows. God knows. He knows all that we are doing. So, my last point there is the consequence. Why is this sermon for me difficult to preach? Of course, I'm scared sometimes a little bit when I prepare a sermon like this for myself. Because it's so easy to live in this world and not ever think about the consequences of what I do and who I am. Not caring really what God wants me to do because I think I've got it. Not really trying to find out what His will for me is. And even if I know I decide, ah, it's not for me. It's for the guy sitting next to me. This is really not for me. 
And God tells me, and He tells you today, my, my son, I love you dearly, but if you mess up, you will reap the consequences. Let's bring Achan back, and then I'm done. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just. Forgive us our sins to clean us from our unrighteousness. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. First John. What about Achan? Didn't he confess his sin? He stood before the whole congregation of Israel and said, I did it. I'm the one. And I'm sorry. I think he's still saved. I'm still, he's still, I think he's still saved. He and his family probably. But they still had to die. They still had to die. Because God said, if you do this, you will die. That's the consequence. If God would have said, okay, he said it's okay, then it was, ah, oh, it's, it's a free ride. What God is saying is that he will forgive us our trespasses. He will forgive us our sins, but we are stuck with the consequences of it. And that's what God is trying to protect us from. A person drinks too much, drives down a popcorn island, hits a tree, wakes up the next day in the hospital, they say, oh, we're so sorry, but, but you were in a terrible accident last night because you hit a tree and we had to amputate both your legs. This guy looks at his bed and there are no feet. There's nothing. And he lies and he says, Lord, I'm so sorry that I drank too much last night because I know that's also a sin to be drunk. Do you think the Lord will forgive him? Absolutely. Will he grow back his legs? Absolutely not. No. He'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life or walk around with prosthetics. And that is what the story teaches me and teaches you. The Bible says we need to live like doves carefully how we respond to things. Satan will try its best to lure us away, to show us devoted things that we say, oh, that's fantastic. This can bring riches and glory and might and all of the things that I want because that's what I can saw fantastic things that could enhance his life and his family. And God said, leave those things alone for a reason. That was not for the nation, that was for God. Later they got what they wanted, but not now. Not now. Trust me, God says, and I will give to you what you want when it's time. Not now. Wait, not now. Live carefully. Seek the will of our Lord. We live in a country where people make decisions for themselves. And I said today to Louise, I'm grateful about the things that the courts decide upon. But to me, it's irrelevant in a sense. Do you know why? It's not about what courts decide. It's about you, what you and I decide when we live our lives in our cubicle, in our house, on the sport field, when we watch TV. That should not be determined by anything or anyone else than the only holy living God and His Word. And He gave us His Word as the guideline, as His direction for us because He's God. And we are not. Amen. It's now time for us to share with the Lord some of the gifts that He gives to us. There's a plate in the back as you leave. Thank you for supporting our ministries. We are involved in the lives of people in many different ways. But as you leave, you can just put a check in there. And for all of you guys watching, you know what to do. You've got all of these online ways to, to give. Thank you, Anna.
Anna, thank you. That was so beautiful. If you can, please stand with me. have so much patience with us. We are terrible in the way that we live and we ignore you and still you come to us. And maybe this world is such a mess because we do not ever think about the consequences of what we do and what happens when we live outside of your will. Lord, help us not to listen to the world or anything else than your word in knowing what's the right thing for us to do. I'm so concerned that the world is turning to all kinds of institutions and things to decide for them what's right or what's wrong. But we have the Word of God that tells us individually what you ask of us daily. So Lord, use us. And use what we have given in this church that we may be the instruments of blessing to the world who needs to know there's a God that loves and cares, but a God that will ask for us to serve you in the way that you want to be served. Amen. You may be seated. Kirby, are you ready to speak? It's your turn. Go for it, man. Well, thank you. Introduce yourself, and I know well he was with me in Israel, so go for it. Thank you, Pastor. Um, as Pastor said, my name is Kirby Calhoun. I'm a field coordinator for an organization uh, called Christians United for Israel. I'm going to give you just a quick intro about who I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing, and then I would ask if you have time to join us for lunch, and then I'm going to give a presentation. It's just under an hour long. It's nothing but history and scripture that dives into Israel. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Munich, Germany. I'm an army brat. My parents were both military, so I was born in Germany on army bases. It's where I grew up. Um, I had the luxury of a kid of traveling. I hated it at the time. Um, many kids probably can relate if you've grown up somewhere where your parents drove all the time. Uh, I had Game Boy at the time, so we were lucky, but I hated driving. I hated seeing things. My mom took me everywhere. The Eiffel Tower didn't have any significance to me. The Arc de Triomphe, Napoleon's tomb, the New Schwanstein Castle, none of that had any kind of major historical significance. But I remember when my mom took me to a concentration camp. And I'm going to tell you this story because this story stuck with me from seven and eight years old. I remember walking into the building one day, and, and we're walking in, and it looked like it could have been a bakery, large ovens. And, and we walked in, and down the hallway to the left, you could go in, and there was this room that had shower heads on the wall. Now, I had heard about, you know, the Zyklon B gas, what happened to the Jews in the concentration camp. We all knew this stuff. Even as a young kid, you know. But nothing prepares you for seeing claw marks on concrete walls. As a kid, I remember that. It stuck with me. Human beings tried to claw their way through concrete as they were gassed to death before they were burned alive or burned and turned into ash. That is what this job means to me. When I think about why I'm doing this, I see that God ordered my steps. He showed me and he, he showed me the compassion historically as a kid. I grew up seeing and understanding what humans can do to one another. Had a rough childhood. Long story short, I ended up joining the Army in 2005 as a human intelligence collector. I went to Iraq as a human intelligence collector for about 17 months. Human intelligence collection is basically interrogations and gathering information from an informant, as you would think of a, a police detective. He's doing his investigation. You get the result. Once I have the information, it was my job to make sure that that target was eliminated or captured. So that's what I did uh, in Iraq came back, decided that I had a little more to offer the Army. I thought I was a little more gung-ho than I, I probably really was. Uh, so I, did to try, uh, I decided to try out for Special Forces. And by the grace of God, I made it through. I earned my Green Beret in 2011. And I was stationed with 7th Special Forces Group as a Special Forces Communications Sergeant. With 7th Group, I deployed to Afghanistan 
and then I also deployed to Colombia in support of a counter-narcotics mission. I got married at 19. I met my wife in the Army. We have two kids. So she got pregnant within, actually, I think it was on our wedding night. <laughs> and at 19, I became a, a dad, and you know, my life changed, and, and we grew up with this life of the military family. I say that because if you'd have asked me in Colombia what I was going to do, I'd have told you I was retiring. But I woke up one day, decided that my family needed to come first. I got out of the army, which is a drastic step of faith for me. But I was not following God yet. I didn't know God. I was born and raised Catholic. But when I joined the military, I walked out of the house. I walked out of church, and I never looked back. But then I joined the National Guard. My unit was in Atlanta, Georgia. I live in the panhandle of Florida, so it's about a five-and-a-half-hour drive. And I had... About three or four months after I got out of active duty, on the drive home one night, about 8 or 9 o'clock, I had my road to Damascus ex experience. God revealed himself to me. I was not looking for him. I was living against God's will in every way. And he gave me a couple pieces of instruction. There's only one that I'm going to share today. One of the things that I had no context for in 2016 was help my people like you would help me. And I didn't know what that meant. So much to the point that I studied the Bible. So first I had to figure out God was real. I had to study his word. So I started diving into the Bible. Has anybody here read the Bible cover to cover? When I read that Bible, it changed my life. What God told me beforehand began to materialize. And we had an event similar to the one that we're gonna have out here. Somebody came to our church and presented this Israel presentation and everything clicked for me. I realized that just like my faith in Christ is an active thing, God's promises are also active. And God told Abraham things thousands of years ago, that for almost 2,000 years, Christians couldn't prove that Israel would be a forever country. Until 1948, that wasn't proof. That was faith. But we live right now in a time where God's promises, as your pastor can attest, can be walked on. As a Christian, we can go to the Holy Land and we see Israel the way that we were supposed to see Israel after almost 2,000 years. So I come here today and my passion for Kufi stems, one, from my personal experience, my, my God experience, if you will, but also as a veteran. And I, don't, I didn't have, before this job, the best biblical perspective for defending Israel, supporting Israel. But I can tell you now that I have a very firm understanding, and I'm going to go into the biblical basis for it over there, but I just want to encourage you to join us. Understanding why Israel is important is the first step to stopping anti-Semitism. It's the first step as a Christian to understanding where God's heart really is. Most of the Bible is Old Testament. Most of the Bible is what Christianity was formed on. Jesus quoted Old Scripture, Old Testament Scripture. It's very relevant. And God promised things to Abraham, to Joshua, to all of the prophets. And those promises are coming true. And Israel is one of those promises. And what we see today in your news, no matter what channel you watch, whether it's CNN, Fox News, whatever, Turn your TV on within 30 minutes, I will point you out a story that has something directly to do with Israel. Whether it is Iran enriching their, nu their, their uranium to attempt to get a weapon, whether it's the Palestinian Authority paying the families of terrorists as they kill innocent people with our tax dollars that are supposed to be going there to support innocent people and to educate kids. Whether it's their school programs where they're teaching two to 15-year-old kids to hate Jews in their doctrine and their education program that our tax dollars paid for. Everything that we do as an American citizen impacts Israel. You know, when we went to Israel, you see the citizen, the average person there knows our rights as Americans have an extreme weight to them. We have a lot of freedom. We have a lot of things to offer God, but there's only one thing that I believe you can offer that you can't get a return on, and that's your time. You'll never get a return on that investment. You'll spend your time, but you won't get it back. I believe that when you spend your time doing kingdom work, when you're obedient to what God has called you to do, whatever your ministry is, he's going to help you thrive. He's going to help you succeed, and he will succeed through you because it's his calling on your life for you. 
I want to help today during lunch to highlight scripture for you. I'm going to bring scriptures that you've probably read dozens, if not hundreds of times. We're just going to bring them to the forefront. We're going to highlight some historical context. And I'm going to show you that the apple of God's eye, the people that he foreknew, the, the people that grafted us in, that brought us to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, he still wants Christians to support his people. We have an obligation to support Israel. One is Christians and two as Americans. And if you'll give me the opportunity at lunch, I would like to just explain that. We're going to go in depth. You're going to leave historically and scripturally more in tune with Israel and what Israel really is meant for and then how to impact it because our actions today directly impact our ally in the Middle East, everything that we do. And that's what we want to bring to the forefront. So, Pastor. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to this. And I will also... Um, his program will take like almost an hour and I in 10 minutes will tell you exactly what I did and then we will start working on our trip to Israel next year. So, yeah. Amen. As we reflect on uh, the story and we reflect on our obedience, when we trust and obey God, he can, we can do all things through him. He is the God of angel armies and we are on his side and he is on our side. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear?
is always by my side. Well, thank you very, very much. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every life that has been born and is now in union with Christ Jesus, our Savior. Guard and guide each one and protect their hearts and minds from the deceit and lies that only come from the devil. Guide each one into the way of truth and give them wisdom and sound judgment. Into your hands we place each child of God and pray for your protection on their lives. Give them discernment to choose the good and reject the evil. And may each one come to a deeper knowledge of Christ and develop a thirst to know you more and more. Too often, if we've got ours, we care little for those who don't. But that's not good enough, and we know it. So, change the world, but begin with us so that we may, can be a part of the solution and not the problem. Give meaningful work to those who have none. Give food to those who are hungry. Give water to those who thirst. Give justice to those who suffer for lack of it. Replace war with peace, despair with hope, suspicion with understanding, callousness with compassion, and isolation with reconciliation in marriages, families, communities, schools, neighborhoods, and churches. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in hell, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debtors, as we forgive those who did. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Final hymn. Sorry. Sam, final hymn. <laughs> I was at Montreat and we did things in a slightly different order this week, so and it was every day. Anyways, please stand and join us in singing the final hymn, Trust and Obey.
If you need someone that you would like to pray for you, Kathy and Sharon are here in front, so approach them after the service and they will gladly pray for you. And next Sunday after church, we are going to pray for Kathy. Uh, she has some cancer issues and it's a stage 3 cancer problem. But next Sunday after church, we will surround her and put our hands upon her and we will pray for her. Um, but today she wants to pray for us. So that's going to be great. I'm going to end this service by what Paul said to the congregation in Ephesians. At the end of his letter, he said the following. Peace be to the whole community who love and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of you who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. We have an undying love for Him. We need to serve Him. As John said in his, in his letter, if you love God, do His will. And this God will bless you. And therefore, may the peace and joy of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge that God really loves you. That God's Son, Jesus Christ, came to this world to die for you and me. Therefore, may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with every one of us every moment of every day as we continue to serve His kingdom and help write His story in this world. Amen. <laughs> came <laughs> at the correct time. Thank you, Sam. Next week, I'm going to end with the book of Joshua. There's now a lot of battles and stuff inside that's not really new information that I can preach on. But next week, the last chapter of the book of Joshua, me and my family, we chose to serve the Lord. So that's what I'm going to preach about. It's um, Independence Day weekend, 4th of July weekend. So if you are gone, you still need to connect somewhat because it's in a fantastic piece of Scripture. Joshua chapter 4 and 24. Can't miss it. It's amazing how God sets it up and then shares with us to make a decision for Him or then against Him. You are invited. Luncheon, Kirby, and I will share a brief moment also about my experience and then we can figure out when we are going to Israel. We need to go and walk where Jesus walked. Yeah. God bless. See you there. <laughs>